Greetings everyone, my name is Professor Les Henry and welcome to the Out of You Where Reason Comes First. And today it is a delight to welcome my, one of my little sisters, Dr. Ope Lori. Dr. Ope, how are you doing? You know, I'm doing mighty fine today. I'm doing good. I'm in Essex, which you may not have known. I'm in Essex at the moment, so I'm, it's been like a good day. Oh, you're an Essex girl now. I've always been an Essex girl. Okay. Actually, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about some of the works, but one of my earliest pieces is about being a black girl in Essex, right? So always been an Essex girl before Towie came out. I don't know right? what that is. What is that? Um, see, I, see, I have to learn the hard way. So I think the only way is Essex. So even before the only way is Essex. Okay, I've yeah, been... um, vaguely, yeah. So yeah, we're going back to... On, on the <laughs> we're but... going back to like birds of feather, birds of feather time, you know? Oh, okay. Dorian. Okay. There we go. That, that, that kind of makes a bit of sense to me. Yeah. I believe my brethren, um, one of my brethren is, is an Essex dude. I, I don't know. Anyway, I don't, I, you know what? From we go through the Black Hole Tunnel, it's all north or west to me. So there you go. Exactly. Through the Black Hole Tunnel. Through the Black yeah. Hole Tunnel. But um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, Dr. Lord, who are you? Who am I? See, that's a very interesting question. So I'm not going to give you the kind of like big spiritual speak because that's another level. But I think on a very surface level, um, like you said, Dr. Opelori, um, I used to be a long time ago, actually I say a long time ago, a few months back, I was a university lecturer. I was doing that for at least 10 years. And then I stopped um, actually in December last year. And since then, I've been doing my company, uh, Pillar Premium Learning in Action, since then. So it's Arts and Diversity Consultancy. So I've been doing that. Um, alongside that, I am an artist as well. And I think the, the art side of things is the one which has opened up many things. And I would like to probably say that if I go back to my earliest, earliest childhood thoughts, I always knew I, I would be an artist. And I always knew that my arts would be the most important thing, the most important contribution that I would make to the world. So I would say fundamentally, I'm an artist. This is my, I said, this is my, my big contribution. Like I said, I think it's part of my essence. Yeah. Um, and I just always knew that in some way or another, it would be my art that would make a difference to the world. Whether that would mean, you know, as an artist who aspires to be in the four white walls of a gallery space, or as with Pillar, it's outside of that, knowing that actually art can make a difference on a bigger scale. I mean, it's all around us, visual culture is everywhere. So I kind of already knew that from a young age that it was important. And I think this is why a lot of my work is based around the visual, what I've read, what I do, it's always around looking practices. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, that a lot of the work you do with positive image learning and action, that's your mm. Pre-image, do you know what? I love your Freudian slip there. <laughs> Pre-image, pre-image learning, learning in action. Pre-image learning and learning in action. I said what? Positive. Positive. Lovely point. In the... <laughs> you oh, know what? And completely. But at the end yeah. of the day, perhaps why I did that is because you know I've been to some of the sessions that that you've delivered, and I see the way mm. you can bridge those distinctions. Paul Gilroy spoke about bridging the distinctions between art and life, and I know mm. you, you exemplify that in your work because. You know, and it leads to a point I wanted to discuss with you. You know, you, you use your work to kind of make a bridge between race or let's say racialization as process and practice, mm -hmm. and practice. gender, how mm. we come at that, those intersections between race, you know, racialized bodies, gender. But more importantly, you always you always um, expose i suppose the ideological underpinnings you're always trying to get people to think about why do we think about these things in this way and why do mm. you, in some ways why are they such constraints i don't know if you want to touch on that do you, do you know thank you for even trying to summarize that way of understanding the work because sometimes you can keep on going into a void where it's actually well if you show multiple different ways really what do you have at the end and I think my challenge has always been to show you the complexities of the situation. There may not be an answer, and actually, it's even good that there's not an answer. It means that actually there'll be many ways to, as they say, and I don't want to say skin a, skin a cat, but really there's many roads to Rome. And that's what I want to show you with the work. However difficult that may be, I want to show you every different possibility. So there's one particular work, actually it's two, two paintings. So when I started, I was actually a painter. 
Um, and actually when I went to art school, I was started off as, as a painter and I love painting. It might be something that I'll go back to, but obviously I, I do more video film photography. But when I was a painter, I had quite a lot of challenges, probably a lot of challenges that other students of, you know, black heritage or um, I don't want to use B-A-M-E, it's a word I actually don't really want to yeah, refer yeah. to. And I think there's a lot of, you know, conversations about how that word doesn't represent a lot of us who, you know, are defined by this politically. Um, but I always remember when I was at art school, I used to paint. And actually one of, the, one of the conversations I used to think about was about this idea of passing and painting. So this idea of, of passing, the historical, like, you know, uh, race narrative. And I used to remember that because I couldn't find any paints that would kind of represent my own skin tone, and because of the fear of, of tutors not being able to understand the work, I used to get colours such as raw umber, or I forgot what, there was another one, like a flesh tint. And I used to mix them in so that you wouldn't even know what the complexion of this character was. So they weren't black, they weren't white, <laughs> they could pass. So that's what I would call passing to pass, right? I wanted to get a degrade and the only way that I could do that was to draw characters which the tutors could read right they could understand in, in some ways so that's the first thing with me in painting but I stopped it um you know I probably had a quite a bad crit with one of the tutors and they probably said you know your painting wasn't good enough obviously in hindsight and even going through that system and also being the teacher of fine art um prior I could see that you know that had a, a massive impact on in terms of what I do now you know, maybe you could say it's fate or it should have happened. So I can't really knock it because I'm happy with the stuff that I'm doing. But, yeah. you know, it's always in the back of my mind. Let's put you on a different road. Yeah, definitely. But you're not off <laughs> the road. You're just on a different road. And you will come back to that road because it's like a cipher. Most, most definitely. Most definitely. So in terms of paintings, so if anyone's really interested, if anyone's watching this and interested, there's two paintings that you can find at, at Tate. And they're by a German artist called Christian Tate Schad. Because for the uninitiated, Tate, Tate Modern. Tate, Tate Modern, you're right. Tate Modern, Bankside. So you can go there. It's, it's part of the collections. In fact, if you go to the uh, what they call the Natalie Bell building um, currently, or the older side of the Tate Modern, it's there on level, I think it's level two. So if you go got the escalator, you go level two. It's in the first two rooms as you, as you walk ahead of yourselves. And there's two paintings by this artist, German artist called Christian Schad. Um, the first one is, and it was done in 1927, is called Augusta the Pigeon-Chested Man and Russia the Black Dove, right? And then just beside this painting, you've got self-portrait. So what you see in the first one is what I would actually think is, is the artist. You've got this white man sitting on this bench, on this seat, and it's very regal, so it's a bit like this, very regal. And just at the bottom of the painting, you've got this black woman, she seems to have Afro hair, and she's sitting, looking at you. Well, for me, she was looking right at me as a fellow black woman, right? So she's sitting quite subservient, and there he is quite regally right above her. Uh, right above her. So white man, so it's called the pigeon-chested man. Actually, the reason it was called a pigeon-chested man is because he had an inverted ribcage. Now, it was said that the artist found these two performers at a Berlin um, fun fair. So he was in there on merit of being, so in terms of disability, we've got the link with disability and race because he, he obviously had, a, he was deemed as being disabled at that time. So he was put in the fun fair along with this black woman of virtue of being black, right? So you've got these two performers that the artist has, has seen and he, and he paints them. So now next to that, so you can talk about Junk's position next to that, you've got this other painting, which is called Self-Portrait. And actually the artist, Christian Schad, f pictures himself in this. So again, you see the painting, you see him sitting in front, so there's a bed, but he's sitting at, in the front, but at the back on his right-hand side or so, you see a white woman. So it's an Italian white woman, and she has a small little scar on her face. And basically that symbolized, so there's a town in, in Italy where the men would mark their women. And to mark the women would mean that actually you owned, you belonged to someone, you were a prized possession of someone. So you've got these two paintings, you've got the white man positioned in the front, in terms for the white woman, he's in the front of the bed, and you've got the white woman at the back to the side. Um, in the first one with um, Russia the Black Dove, you've got the black woman at the bottom, you've got him composite at, at the top. So these paintings, depending on how you see it, they can be highly problematic. I like them. 
And these are the things sometimes, there's things that probably we're really irritated against, you know, that causes a lot of trauma. Sometimes we still like them as well, for whatever reason. Absolutely, absolutely. (laughs) I don't think people would be a hypocrite. It's like, I personally don't like slackness. Yeah. Unless it's clever in reggae music. To me, if it's clever, it's risque, like what General Echo used to do, or Professor Nuts, or, you know, people who are probably alien to you. And even some of the bad man lyrics, I like them if they're clever. But mm-hmm. I mean, when things are just vulgar and they're just there for no, they don't really have any real purpose. That's different. Yeah. I'd be a fool. I like action films and and watching films. But exactly. Say to anybody, go and get an M sixteen and wipe everybody out because it spilled <laughs> your coffee. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, so, I get you. No. So no, you're right. Because I think there's there's a, there's a love to hate thing with that. And for me, for that, for that painter, it was a love to hate thing. And I think what's also quite important is that when I first saw, so I've had everyone, you know, has their different journeys. And actually when I first saw that painting, I started as a, as a gallery attendant at the Tate. I was working for a service provider at the time. Um, and as a gallery attendant, it's the first piece of work that I saw. And for me as a 19 year old, you know, I'm 36 now, but as a 19 year old, I just clocked that painting and I clocked the black woman first and foremost. I just thought, you know what? I completely get where you're coming from. Like, I, just, I can see myself in you, not because I feel that I'm suppressed or oppressed in that way, but I understood the positions and the hierarchies of race and gender. I knew at the very top, you've got white men and everything else. I was you know, at the very bottom, you got black women. And I think that was exemplified by that painting. Those two paintings, you can't read it just one by itself. You have to read it with the other. Because in the other painting, the white woman's in a slightly higher position, but she's still objectified by the white man. And also this became a real turning point for me. So initially when I was doing a lot of my work, I was thinking, you know what? It was really important to show black women, to be visual, uh, for us to be seen. And that was a lot of the work I was making at the beginning. And I think there's a definite place for that work. And I needed that probably for me, for a lot of people, for a lot of black women, we needed to see ourselves, right? And that's what I was doing. I was making sure that we were visible. But I also realized that I was doing that in retrospective to the place of white women as well. I was like, okay, well, white women are seen. So we need to be seen as well. Uh, White women that take that position, why are we not? So that has been a lot of my rhetoric. But those two paintings for me, also gave me kind of like a catch-22 moment because what I read is that both positions I don't want to swear I said both positions are fucked up however you want is it well both positions are fucked up (laughs) because however you want to look at it whether white black women take a a more oppressive role or white women actually white women are all over the galleries you know in the ancient history pieces shown there to be seen that's equally as bad Do I actually even want to be in that position? As a black woman, do I want to be smeared everywhere and objectified in that way? So really for me, that was my kind of turning point. However you want to look at it, both of us are fucked up. And that really just plays into this idea of this patriarchal system. And as difficult as it might be, part of my rhetoric has always been, you know what? Sometimes you have to work together. We have to come together if you want to get a better result. And that's why all of my work has always been about this black woman, white woman situation or light and dark. If you want to talk about colorism, it's about all of those things and bring it together and realize that actually there's a bigger thing at play here, which is actually nothing to do with these divisions. We have to go beyond that. Yeah. And that's really been at the point of it. For me, that's what I was saying about, you know, what I, I find when I've, when I've, you know, worked with you or the presentations and watched mm-hmm. you, you bring out those ideological underpinnings in the sense that we're talking about the systems of ideas that drive because we're in mm. some way well not in some ways in every way we're talking about aesthetics we're talking about you know how are certain things represented what is beautiful what is ownership mm. what is mm. what is liberation what is freedom what is agency Mm. And all of these things are ideologically un- they ideologically underpin you know the aspects that you raise and that's one of the reasons why I wanted you to speak about that because I remember one of your your exhibitions that I went to um no it wasn't that it was when you showed me some of your work yeah and it was about the 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 passing and the shadism thing and I remember the person morphed throughout mm. that piece of work so I don't know if you if you can 
just yeah. jog my memory about that because yeah. I remember it was I, I just looked at it and I thought are you talking about the piece which was uh, looking at pornography or are you talking about Snow White because the Snow White Snow White that... I think it's, it's the Snow White you might okay. leave that <laughs> well it wasn't to be put in that way it was critiquing no, I, know, I, know, so I want remember, to tell people I did the presentation for you yeah exactly uh, exactly it hit me into was it the Royal College of Art I remember that woman was basically saying she didn't get it yeah I remember when I got in there and I it, used some of your work in it most definitely it was Chelsea School of Art Chelsea and of you're art. right and this and is I mean I used your work to challenge yeah what they were saying was aesthetically of value within that yeah. space and yeah. people got uncomfortable as they do but i yeah. believe it's snow white it's I'm snow white so i'll try and remember a few things that you just said just now because i think you're right um i remember that so i thought it was a great and you know again i'm so humbled to be on this because you know i think i've known you for a very long time and i'm so honored that you even took the time out to look at my work at that point even speak about my work as well mm -hmm. um so we'll, we'll leave part of that aside um yeah. but i even remember that when we were doing that, yes, there were going to be a couple of people who probably didn't get it. And actually, that's fine as well, because everyone has their different perspectives of it. As difficult as it may be, you know what? Your black experience may be different from mine. Your gender experience will be different from mine. But you know what? We still have to meet Aita at some point, because how do we all live with different perspectives? So I think that's one thing. Um, the initial thing you said was about the... Um, was about the systems, isn't it? So actually, it is something I like to call the setup. And actually, when I go back to those paintings, yeah. the setup is really the structure. It's the frame. In fact, it can look in, it can be seen in many different ways. So the setup is about how you may stage something. It's about the framework. It's about the systems, right? So those are a bit more physical things, the structures. But also an interesting way of looking at the setup. So the anagram of the setup would also be the upset as well. So sometimes I said the answer is always in the question. The question is in the answer. It goes vice versa. So if you really want to destabilize something, I always say you've got to cause an upset. So you can see the two words there cause a bit of a, an upset. So really what I'm interested in is that system. That system, whether you want to call it man-made, female-made, trans-made, or whatever you want to call it, it's still being made in a certain way. And because it's been made, it also means that it can be unmade. Hence why sometimes when a lot of people talk about, you know, the systemic, uh, you know, racism, actually, I don't want to use, I never use the term systemic as much as it might be ingrained, it was also put there as well. So I would prefer to use systematic, right? It also means that actually we have the power to change how these things are, but actually it's a process as well, right? It can be undone, it's not fixed. And those are some of the things which I've, you know, I'm an advocate for that these things, as much as they're made, they can be unmade. And I know you use this wonderful phrase, which is what can be learned can be unlearned right so those are the sorts of things i always try to reinforce but if i go back to the snow white the snow white actually arose from you know when i was seven and it's it's something that again has stayed with me and probably why i do art i remember like many kids probably watching snow white you know i watched the old one i think it was 1937 so it's just about in color right so i watched it as a seven-year-old and i watched it with my two sisters an older sister younger sister i have an older brother as well but we all watched it. And, you know, when I watched it, I was so taken aback by this. I thought, wow, Snow White is beautiful. This is what I just thought. I thought this, this woman is beautiful, right? Even the birds, if you go and look at it again, the birds were singing and chirping. Everything looked beautiful. Aesthetically, it was just on point. And I remember straight after watching that, I ran upstairs to our, 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 our bathroom upstairs. There was talcum powder there. And I remember just caking my face with talcum powder. I just caked it. Right. And then I remember skipping downstairs like Snow White. It's almost like I was hearing the music. And I went to show my sisters. And my sisters were like, they were obviously shocked. I mean, think about it. I was seven. They were, my little sister was five. My old sister was nine. So that was just crazy. So I thought, OK, they're not getting it. I mean, they're obviously not appreciating how good I look. So I start skipping along now and I show my dad. And obviously my dad being a typical Nigerian man, a wonderful guy a wonderful person i'm in his library at the moment i remember he said just said to me oh, man, what what are you doing what and i'm obviously i got beaten i think at that time i got beats or whatever you want to call it but as terrible as that was that was an eye-opener for me like i knew at that time i had done something wrong i had negated my blackness in trying to be this ideal image and that stuck with me it's always stuck with me 
And that's why I need two things. One, that the power of imagery was so strong. That this thing could create an identity, that the images were so seductive that I wanted to become someone else. And that's why sometimes it's, it's troubling when you look at representations because it's got that particular pull. So that was one thing. But the second thing is that I negated myself. I negated my blackness. And again, that, that was something that I didn't want to do. And that's something that was my dad scolding me for. So it was a pivotal moment and that has informed a lot of my work. So initially I was thinking about ideas about colorism. We're talking about the skin complexions. And it's interesting that, you know, we talk about it now, but these things have been going on for time, you know, and they keep on going on as well. You know, there's loads of uh, black women, you know, whether it's here or it's America, or Nigeria, or it's Asia, having similar experiences about, you know, the privileging of lighter skin, using products, whatever have we. And obviously a lot of this is to do with media images as well. You know, we know that certain things sell. We know we've got the terms of ethnically ambiguous or lighter skin. I think things could be changing. This is a, a moment where actually it's, it's great to be black. It's great to be darker skin, especially now when everyone's talking about the, the you know, systemic racism or systematic racism. So this is a time when people are starting to clock on to that, but it's still, it's still an issue. I think there was a recent campaign in Asia. It was like a TikTok video in Japan or somewhere. And, um, someone had either they had kind of like lightened up their skin or something like that so these things are still going on because businesses know that it sells you know yeah. this message is still, as much as you might complain about it the companies still make the same issues because it's still like they say no publicity is good publicity or no you know so they still benefit from things. yeah all publicity is good publicity thank you thank you yeah so um Something else I wanted to discuss was about, mm. um, you know, how you could take us through a, one of your pieces that kind of, mm. you know, what can I say, that kind of explain again, you know, what drives you to do the work that you do because, you know, other than you and and my good friend Dr. Sarita, Dr. Yeah. Sarita Mullings Lawrence, who I introduced you to. You're probably the first people who actually got me to appreciate anything to do with art. Because if you'd asked me about art before, I'd have said, boy, I do art. <laughs> there you go. Because you know why people <laughs> made it out to be so complex? Mm. People made it out to be so complex, but it was um, it was only having like, after having those kind of conversations with you and you taking me through some of your work. I remember when you were doing your thesis. You know, we discussed mm. certain things, especially around aesthetics, around colorism mm. and stuff like that. And it was um, it was John Berger. Uh, mm. John Berger used to be on TV, used to do these art programs on TV. And I know Les Back, um, Prof Les Back interviewed him in one of his books or spoke to him. And, you know, he said music and rhythm changed the significance of a picture. But I don't yeah. think he was just talking about music that people were talking about. It's that yeah. rhythmic. You can add another dimension to it so people can at least offer an interpretation that isn't yeah. necessarily highfalutin or has to be here and, you know, like that kind of stuff. And I think yeah. that's what you did. Yourself and Sarita, that's what you did for me. You made me realise that, you know, you don't have to see it this way or listen to what these people are saying you should be able to look mm. at it through your own lens and say this is how it speaks to me in much the same way as a piece of music will speak to exactly. an individual so you know um, obviously one has to appreciate the work of, of john berger i think an amazing thinker and i think as soon as you were talking about his ways of seeing i mean someone that definitely was, yeah, yeah. a lot of people have to go back to some of the things that he said right back in the 70s and yeah very very pivotal so one of the things about the music actually which is quite interesting I think perhaps and I haven't read that particular section where he talks about the link with music and images I think it's right because in some ways you're you're you're, you're talking about people's emotions you're attaching emotions about how to how you read a particular image so actually it's going beyond and which is it's a great reference you've just used you're going beyond representation you're going beyond the surface to actually touching someone on another level. And that is also another thing which, you know, as much as I'm interested in representation and definitely being, you know, it's all around us, but also how do you move beyond it? Because it's also very problematic. You know, people fighting for representation, people fighting to be seen, but actually 
how do you move beyond something which shouldn't be seen? They say that there's a brilliant saying that says, all that is important is invisible, right? So, and this is where music comes in because actually it's touched on another register. And, you know, I've got some really great, there's some great artists, an artist called Ajamu. He's a brilliant uh, black gay male artist. And, you know, he talks about this. He talks about these ideas of what does queer mean? You know, he's interested in photography as a photographer graphic fine artist but actually it's more than that because if you look at the images it will touch you on another level so he even talks about his processes he talks about going in the dark room the dark room which you could see is a bit like you know going in the sex room right you talk about desires you talk about the intimate innate things that we touch on right so i think this is the most important thing that like how do you move away from representation even though we're caught up in it so there has to be another register and i think that is why my work for me is important i also want to show that other thing that thing that you know i can't articulate why this thing you know irks me yes. the way it does i can't articulate why i like it and that can be very uncomfortable to come to terms with but you know what it does it for me and sometimes when i'm making work i can't tell you when the work is complete or when it's when it's finished what i will say is if it moves you on another level then i know it's my work is done so that's how i see and that's how i i critique my work but there's one piece and again if anyone's interested you can see on on my website it's got a long title so i always have to try and remember this it's got a very long title and actually was taken um from um a a writer called ken gonzalez day and it was a text around whiteness so it was trying to understand how we can understand how whiteness operates but he looks to this idea of what gray is right so gray is an intermediate space this is actually there's multiple ways to understand something and that's really important to show so the piece is actually called after all sometimes just changing the point of view can transform the landscape right so after all just changing the point of view can transform the landscape and what you will see in this piece are eight characters Four, it's actually four characters who play two different roles one in white one in black so it's a four similar characters and they play op opposing roles you could say so you've got a police figure or authority figure you've got a religious figure someone like an imam or a, a, a priest um you've got the youth who's wearing a hoodie um, you've also got um, a woman in a burqa, right? So for me, those are four characters that we know in our social imaginary, in the social landscape, evoke some sort of fear or some sort of tension. You know, anyone we know from the from the riots, especially the ones I think in 2009, where we saw a lot of people, people were in hoods or people were like, you know, ransacking. 2011, I think it was. 2011, thank you. So even I knew at that time, okay, if I'm going to the shop, do not wear a hoodie, do not wear this, because I probably think that, oh my gosh, you must be one of those people who was looting, because hoodies are so loaded, right? Certain clothes, and this is where it comes down to dress, right? A certain dress that is so loaded. I don't want to take up a tangent, but actually, maybe it's it's worth pointing out. There's a scene. Do you watch Black Lightning by any chance? Black I've Lightning. Seen bits of it. I've seen, seen some of them. I think I saw the first couple of series when that the weird looking in Jamaica we call them Dundas, so the PC brigade can come out. But he looks like a <laughs> right. kind of thing. Yeah. Right. So I mean, again, I saw, I like saw up to one where I don't know. I think they. I don't know. Yeah. And anyway, I've seen bits of it. Yeah. Okay, like you, I've seen bits to me. I probably saw one or two and I just gave up. I know you're a Marvel fan, you, you like your DC comes, so you know all of those things. Um, but I think there was one of the opening scenes, a policeman stops Black Lightning when he was dressed in a suit. So when he stops in, he goes, officer, how can you get me? Like, why did you stop me? Can't you see I'm wearing a suit, <laughs> right? So as a black man, it's almost like, okay, because I'm wearing a suit, you shouldn't have really taken me because, yeah. Yeah, it's all about the dress. If you start thinking about who's probably pulled over, is there a certain blackness that is being policed as well, right? As much being black, is there a type of blackness, is there a type of look, a type of dress which is also being policed? So that's a bit, I'm steering off, but this is why going back to the piece that I made, it was very much important that, you know, dress was part of it. You know, how, you know, whether you're wearing hoodies, we know that we had it John Charles Menendez, the, the, the shooting of... Yeah, um, yeah. In Stockwell, somewhere, wasn't it? Yeah. 2005, Stockwell, 
right? Yeah. So again, they thought that he looked like a terrorist, right? So we know that there's a certain time, and he probably still now, they're probably Muslim men who have beards, you probably don't want to have beards because some may think that you're a terrorist, you got a backpack, right? So again, all of these stereotypes as well, you've got the woman in the burqa as well, right? The fear that a woman in the burqa has, and you've got police figures. So you've got these four characters played in white, and then they do the same in another color. And actually, when you look at the video, actually, you, write, you realize it's black. When we did the casting for the shoe, I actually said to him, okay, one of the shots, you're going to be in white. But in the other one, just bring whatever you want to wear. And it just so happens that they all brought black. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's interesting. So, See, that's so interesting it was, in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was their choice. So they all, they all brought very dark colors that when you, you shoot it, it just looks like black. So for me, it was about showing the two sides of the story. And I think this is actually important because I never really talk about this. The reason I also made that piece, I think just a week before I had a, you know, I was having a meeting with, I went to find a new accountant. I went to find an accountant for, for the business. And I remembered going into this place uh, somewhere in the East Dulwich at the time. And I had a meeting with this guy who seemed to be like the, the, the founder of, of this accountancy. And I remember sitting in front of him and he was obviously at his desk, I was in front of the desk. And it was it was so awkward. I felt, that, to be fair, this guy wasn't really listening to me. He just, you know, he was just, it was all lip service. And I just had that, probably that feeling that, okay, well, he's not taking me seriously, you know, maybe because I'm a young black woman or whatever, or whatever he thought. And I knew it just wasn't gonna work. And I just, you know, I had that moment. And I saw this, you know, what he appeared to be, just like Christian shared, sitting down there quite regally, feeling like he was in, power and there I was opposite to him so I've always again been interested in this kind of sissing positions as well because a lot of the things we're talking about it's always these power relationships and how they get played out and I was just fascinated that this white man and that's what it was a white man at the time was wielding all of this power but you know was so in my estimation was someone who's just so I don't say evil but just he just he just didn't get it he did I, I knew he wasn't going to take me on so for that piece, I want to show all the horrors and all the great stuff about being both white and black. That these, you know, these stereotypes we've seen historically positioning blackness as evil or ugly and all those sorts of things, as opposed to whiteness, which is passive, beautiful, blah, blah. Actually, it can be vice versa, right? You can be white and still be horrific and still embody all of these things. Similarly with black, you could be black and be most peaceful, right? So when you see the work, these bodies are walking. So all the four characters, at some moments, they're very passive. They're not doing anything. Second moment, they burst out and start being very aggressive, right? So it's this idea, it's reinforcing or unbreaking or challenging those notions of how, what is the performance of blackness or what is the performance of whiteness? And again, really understanding how whiteness operates. So a really good way of, of, of discussing this would be, you know, as you talked about, the, when we talked about art, you said, you know, sometimes you thought that you, you couldn't understand art, that you've got to be either clever to do so, or, you know, you just didn't get it. It's the way we're programmed and conditioned. No. You know, we'll watch these programs and because mm. we perhaps haven't had that much experience of meeting artists who are just mm. normal, Mm. We think that the only way you can appreciate it is to look through a particular lens, which has a particular particular set of linguistic codes, aesthetic, whatever it is, norms and values that, you know, it's a bit like high high culture. Then we are taught that these things are high culture. Yes. You know, as opposed to, you know, what we would do would be low culture. Mm. Because if you even think about this artist Banksy, you know, mm. he would have been, 15 years ago, Tony Blair would have locked him up and given him an ASPO. Most <laughs> it's true. He would have locked him up it's and given him an ASPO. Banksy, what? It's <laughs> because that whole thing has changed and the so-called art world has embraced what he does, because that's the only way they can get that much dosh. And I yeah. actually think he's a plant, but there you go. I don't think it's one person either. But I'm See, into I conspiracy you. theories, so I, I, I was just going to say, watch V for Vendetta, and you'll get an idea of what I'm. Okay. But, no, I was going to say we're going to conspiracy territory here, but maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. I don't really know. For me, but, the, the major point is though, I needed I needed to meet people who could say 
there's nothing wrong with if you see it this way or you say that just yeah. looks like one bag of foolishness to me like you know you give a picnic some crayon and say go on you know definitely right definitely but we're not taught that we're taught there's only one way to appreciate things um but going back to this idea of whiteness again and it's kind of performing as well and going thinking yeah. about art you know, yeah. and it's classy when, as well most definitely Very much we know that if you went to art right. gallery yeah when you go into art gallery, or even myself, sometimes I fall back into that. And I think, you know, I'm an artist, but there's a way you conduct yourself in a gallery. And we speak about this. There's no reason why you have to go around so slowly or you have to look <laughs> like you're intellectually engaged with art, the painting, which actually you probably don't know anything about, right? But it's a performance as well. And like yeah. you said, it's not necessarily yeah. just about race or whiteness or whatever. It's also about class. It's about all of those things. And for me, sometimes I think about that in terms of when I used to teach. And I've got, if when I was interested, there's a, there's, a, there's a book which is out at the moment. It's called Arts, Education and Intersectionalities under the name of Kate Hatton. So I've written a chapter in there which is unpacking ideologies for people who teach for, who are Black or who are non-white, right? And thinking about the challenges that we have ourselves when we teach. You know, I had to think about, okay, well, I'm teaching at these two really good art schools the predominantly white students, I'm thinking, okay, as a black teacher, should I be teaching so much of black culture? You know, so I always had to try and think, okay, well, maybe I'll do a bit of this, I'll do a bit of that. So I don't want to be a little bit too heavy, right? And that that sort of thing is also conditioning, right? It's playing into these ideologies. There's no reason why wouldn't be, if a black artist or Asian artist is tackling all of these things, why would I not say why would I not put that in the curriculum, right? So it's also about challenging those things that stop us, right? So it's, it's still a performance, higher, lower, whatever you want to call it, right? But see, these are some of the challenges. So is it, for me, this is, you know, having to unpack whiteness, but it's all this the psychology that we bring to it. We have to really reflect on our own assumptions and the things that we do so that we don't reinforce into these things. Absolutely. And for me, what you've just done, you've just exemplified decolonizing the curriculum. Yeah. The problem with a lot of white academics, especially those ones who are entrenched in those bastions of Britishness or whiteness or, mm. you know, and I keep saying it, oh, we can't, it, you're saying, take out all the white academics, take out all the white knowledges, take out all the white kinders, and I use knowledge as plural. Mm. But that's not what we're saying. What we're basically saying is, why can you not have balance? And if you don't know, yeah. ask somebody who may know. But, because that's what people often don't do. They will have their one way, their myopic way of seeing it. I was taught like that by many. If, if, mm. if I had 30 lecturers at Goldsmiths, 25 of them were so fixed. Yeah. You know, so entrenched in this is the only way to do it. This is the only way you can speak about someone like Foucault. This is yeah. the only way you can speak about yeah. this person or that person. And then you can go to them with something and you can say, well, actually, you know, um, Wade Nobles or, or Dr. Leonard Jeffries, they've spoken about the same kind of things, these notions of power. Why can we mm. not speak about them as well? Yeah, why can't we think... bring in people like Stuart Hall or not Stuart Hall or you know, yeah, why not people like Marcus Garvey when yeah. he's talking about systems and, and power and relationship and education yeah. and Definitely. human rights? Why can we not bring them in? So, it is that that notion yeah. of de I'll say it again, I'll say it probably till my grave decolonization of curriculum is easy. Mm. Sometimes you just have to get off your high horse and say, you know. Every single time I teach, every module I teach, I think it's improved because I always encourage my students, is there anything that you're aware of that will deal with what we're going to be discussing next week that you can bring to the table? Definitely. And especially in like my third year option, race, ethnicity, and popular culture, where we look at everything. We, we look at race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, we look at processes like mammification, how black women were reduced to mammies or jersey bells. We look at that. Mm -hmm. And we also touch on aspects of religion. You know, how mm -hmm. do people express themselves? Brilliant. And I like that because really, then you start breaking down all these sorts of hierarchies about where knowledge comes from. So Actually, I think I don't want to go off you and start making generalizations and all the same things, but I do think a lot of the work, you know, I think 
universities institutions brilliant but for a lot of people for myself i know sometimes a lot of the work happened outside as well right you never know where you're going to draw all of these things from so it's important like you just said whether balance can be achieved i don't know but i think we should always be aiming to you know absolutely yeah. many people as possible so even i would say that the areas that okay i could probably talk about race and gender quite a lot I would also say, okay, the areas which I know that I would probably be a bit more weaker on, if anything to do with disability, what would it mean for a, a black artist with disability to be making work? So again, I know that I need to start doing that extra work. I know that I might have some students who might have disability. How do I reach them, right? So like you said, go and do the work. When we're in institutions, you're a minority. You always learn how the system works, right? Before you start a new job, I'm pretty sure that you've probably... Googled and said, found out what the stats for this organization. You probably find out who is the CEO or who is the boss. You do your work because you're going into a new environment, right? And it's the same way. I think lecturers, teachers, we need to do the same thing, especially if you're in the majority. Think about, okay, what does it mean if you were in the minority? If you, as sons, I always like to use this, if you were the only one in the room, how do you reach that only one person, right? You've got to cater to everyone. And it's not so much hard work, right? It could even be fun when you start learning things outside of your comfort zone. So I think you're right. We can try and get balance. Try to just do the work. That's it, do the work. Because Marcus Garvey said many of us are educated beyond the four walls of the classroom. And I know I absolutely right. was. I got booted out of the four walls of the classroom by the time I was 16. <laughs> but, you know. I'm laughing. But to me, but... that's what it is. Because, you know, that's what Rastafari said. Rastafari said we, we learn from life. I know mm. they're not the only ones, the first, and they won't be the last ones. But... That's what they basically say. You look at your life. Going off piece a little bit here, people have statistics and, you know, say, you know, black people in comparison to white people or this and whatever. Actually, I would leave that to the, to the wayside. I don't even want to. I don't think it's right to compare in that way. So I don't think it's helpful. I don't need just because you have this, I also need to have that. Actually, yeah. let's go beyond that. Let's just think about, okay, what does it mean to be black and do these things without having to be compared to white people and that's this because actually you're always going to be compared to that norm and that should never be my, my center my center is going to be my center and it my center my universe is going to be what it means to be black what it means to be lesbian what it means that's my center and i don't want it to be, always be compared to any other because it will always be measured in that way and that will not give us the liberation that we're looking for Absolutely. so um, you know perhaps going off another tangent but i think you know when we start talking about difference power and or as you just said equity i think we're, we're going to different things we have to look beyond these conditioning ways right this is kind of like prescri prescriptive behavior palo Freire, someone i always go back to time yeah. and time again yeah. Yeah. and actually some of the things i also think is that as much as i started off thinking about race actually it was never just about race it's more yeah. about liberation of thinking it was about how do we on think what we've been programmed to think. How do we be free? How do we be at peace with ourselves, right? Yeah. So again, Palo Freire, brilliant. I'm sure a lot of people might have read the um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Yeah. Again, when he starts talking about prescriptive behaviours, yeah. the oppressor yeah. will do something. Now I respond, I have a knee-jerk reaction, but it's all part of the game. Actually, you know what? I could say, to hell with you. <laughs> to hell with that game. Right. I'll do my own thing. Yeah. And that's me. That's why I say sometimes we have to do away with representation. Forget about it. Forget about what is. I understand people want to be recognized and seen, definitely. But at what cost? Especially where representation in itself can be so flawed. It's ambiguous. It gets things wrong. So why do I even want to be in that particular space? You know, I will go back to. Um, I know if you watch all these reality shows, I always talk about all of these things, you know. I don't, but go ahead. You don't. I'm sure if I said it, at least you'll know, like, maybe the, the, the controversies. You know, it's like seeing a lot of these black women on some of these shows, like, you know, whether it's um, Take Me Out, whether it's, um, what's it called, Big Brother. Yes, I know. I like the way your eyes are going. Where it's Big Brother. <laughs> we had a <laughs> Big Brother I've heard of. And yeah, Big Brother I'm joking. You know, I've heard of Big Brother. <laughs> big brother and um, what else you had love island i always say this again it goes back to the setup right you have all of these poor black women who go there because they're looking for love again i don't we would never call it you know reality tv she's looking for love i think it's on on love or on reality tv that's what i call it there's yeah, no way yeah, you can look for love yeah, in these yeah. shows right but you have the same sort of pattern that will occur 
lone black woman goes in she doesn't understand why you know she's getting this negative response people don't like her they don't fancy her same pattern goes in beautiful black woman right starts crying why is this happening to me why is this happening to me happened in all of these series right okay. so i always say don't go on i don't want to say this is a bit of a cop out that actually don't need to go on a show but i think in some ways sometimes you have to as i said cause an upset just be done with it don't do it don't get involved in it especially when it's not created for you but i suppose there's the other argument that's that sometimes crucial, you're in it. the crucial bit though sorry to cut yeah. you is it's not created for you yeah you're there you're like um you're peripheral you're like that mm. tokenistic peripheral inclusion yeah yes. But again, this is part of the setup. So again, if you want to look at the setup as well, we talk about structure, but also this idea of being set up, being set up to fail, it's an illusion, right? So if the structure is already fa faulty, and now you say you want to enter this structure, it's just not going to work. And I think it doesn't have to be reality to you. Sometimes you also got to think about it, again, going back to curriculum, going back to education. You know, I used to think about, when people talk about widening participation, it's, it's part of my pet peeve words, right? Yeah. You know, you're trying to get students into a particular space who might not have been able to get into this space. And that could be for a range of reasons. But at the same time, that institution, when these poor students get in there, right, it fails them as well. So it's almost like reinforcing this ideology instead of to address the issue before at the root. So that when the students come into these spaces, these institutions, they're ready for it. But the institution is already set up in such a way that these students will fail. Not all of them, but they'll fail. They'll find an uphill struggle, right? So this is why the setup is so important that we've got to understand, is it working for everyone? Regardless of race, regardless of gender, class, is, does it work for everyone? And if it doesn't work for everyone, what do we need to do? And this is where we need multiple voices. That's the be your end. We need multiple perspectives. And even if we had, okay, you bring more people of color. We, uh, I know we've had discussions about not using that term because I don't like to use that term because of its historical associations to to race and racism in the US. Yeah, so I get, I know. I, I know. I'm, I'm more relaxed on this program. You're more relaxed a bit now. Yeah. On this program, think, no, not a bit. I don't want people, hey, listen, oh. don't, but I feel sick and around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, more relaxed think, on this program because at the end of the day you know it's your platform yeah no it's very true but i think again we have to think does the space work for everyone so similarly you know disability class and if it's not working what can we do to make it work so really we need different voices different people and you know whether they say okay you need more people of color more BAME people representatives even that sometimes is not even the best way <laughs> as well, because you might still need multiple people of color, because even you and I may still have different perspectives, different experiences of blackness, right? Of course. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of endless, but I think one of the things you said as well, which I think is important is that if you don't know something, or you know this is going to be challenging, go and do the work, go and find people be able to help you as well. Right, so sis, Ope. Mm. Don't look so tense. Do you know what up here actually means? No, tell me. So up here actually means whatever I have is enough to give thanks to God. That's beautiful. So, so what's one surprising thing you can tell us about up here? Oh, it's surprising that I used to have what is called escalophobia. So being scared of escalators, right? So it's actually a term. Um, and I remember when I was like, very, very young, I used to hate going down escalators because my whole world, it seemed like I couldn't see things clearly and actually it's quite interesting because it's also to do with perception and maybe that's an again artist. well that's what my dad was saying exactly because i'm an artist my whole imagination my whole mind i just couldn't compute it but i think there was just one day it just it just fell into line and i could see that okay i'm standing or something but for at least a good when i was much younger for a good couple of years i was i was petrified to go up and down so dr oppo laurie what takeaway can you give us what takeaway? Well, obviously not talking about jollof rice and plantain and chicken because I made the best of that. You actually mean a real takeaway. So <laughs> my takeaway, I think, is going back to this idea of when we spoke about balance and do, doing the work, speaking for everyone, as many people as possible. So I always use this thing called what would it mean to be the only one in the room? 
we've all probably been there at some point in our lives where we start a new job or you are the minority in whatever that context is. So I think if we use that as something to think about that experience, how uncomfortable it probably felt, maybe it felt great to be the only one, but if we can go back to that and to that experience, I think that's something that we should all try to think about. If we want to make a more inclusive world, let's use that mindset and that moment to change how we make the world a bit more accessible and inclusive for everyone. What can I say? Give thanks, um, Sis Ope. I always say this to people, I know we'll link up soon, absolutely, and in fact, we've got some stuff to talk about we do. anyway, but I know we will definitely yeah. link up soon. And it's been a pleasure, you know, being enlightened by you on Out of You Where Reason Comes First. And all I can say, stay blessed, stay focused, and stay you, which I know you will anyway, because I'm count and you. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for having me.